Hey there, welcome to the program. This is Our Healthy Homes, ourhealthyhomes.com. That's the big website. That's the one that everybody in the country is going to. That's where you find out how to get well and healthy. Or you call 651-775-9194. Speak directly to the lovely and talented Sheila, and she'll get you steered off into the right direction, get you fixed up and on your way to becoming happy, healthy, and whole. This is Our Healthy Homes. We talk about the four pillars of a healthy home. We talk about the real estate. We talk about the ecosystem, body, and your mind and spirit. Today, we're going to kind of focus on a little bit more, I guess, of the technical side or the real estate side of things. We're really continuing on with our series that we be, have done. This is the, the be the last one of the series on death and dying, and it's what happens after you die, right? Uh, everybody's going to die. We all know that. We try to live a long, healthy, fruitful life, but eventually we're going to all kick the bucket. And when we do, <laughs> we usually leave behind some stuff. And uh, that yes, has to do. go through a, a process in order to uh, clear it out. As everyone knows, I'm a certified probate real estate specialist, but I am not an attorney. So we're blessed today to have Kim uh, Perkle on the program uh, with... Uh, Blanky, Perkle, Blanky. Blonic, Perkle, and Stoll. Blonic, Perkle, yeah, and Stoll. Yeah, we chose the okay. three hardest names possible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyhow. Uh, yeah, them. So they, they have a, a firm, and she is a uh, probate uh, expert because she is an attorney. 952-447-4424. That's the number. If, you're, if you write it down, I'll say it again slow. 952 447 4424. We're going to talk about the process of probate, what it is, how you go through it, why it's important, and uh, so that it can uh, help you if uh, you get into that situation. Let's just, can, before, I want to do something before we get going, because oh. once I get going, I will go down a rabbit hole, and, and there it is. And I want there to, we go. I know, and there we go, and, I, and we lose the whole uh, show. So I want Sheila, first of all, before I get lost in my own thoughts. Mm-hmm. To tell, us, a topic that's to tell us to tell us about us. the muffin top countdown because I or muff, muffin top meltdown <laughs> but countdown is countdown quick. too that, that works too yeah. right okay so um, first of all if you if you haven't um, gone to my Facebook page just the regular old Sheila Hitner go there and I posted a picture of me the other day people. Um, I don't have a lot of pictures of when I was heavy because I hid behind the camera. Mm. Uh, so I dug one out because people don't believe it. And so go there. It's it's pretty funny, you know, but um, and, and why I say that. But is, you had a great personality. I, <laughs> I hope I still do <laughs> <laughs> after going 180 <laughs> to 125, like I hope so. But uh, and so. You know, your weight and all that ebbs and flows throughout mm-hmm. your whole life, right? Mm-hmm. But once you seem to hit that 40 mark, something happens. And the hormones change, the body changes, you're busy chasing kids, you're busy, busy, busy with everybody else, mm-hmm. but not but not you. You're right. not busy taking care of you. And so women just get the belly bulge, the muffin top, the tire around the stomach. And so I have put together a program like he says, is guaranteed to get you out of the belly bulge and get back into your genes, stop feeling ashamed of yourself. Maybe maybe this is affecting your relationship and you, you realize it or you don't realize it. Uh, and so I am here to help you with that. It is possible. And I always like to say, if I can do it, you know, anybody can do it. But where I feel like people are failing, missing out, not not hitting the mark, trying over and over and over again is because they don't have that cheerleader or that accountability partner on their side to move them through the things that are going to happen and and be there for them. Well, just so they understand where they're at and it gets to the root cause. Yes, right. It, it, isn't, right. A, it isn't a take this and you're going to lose weight and right. as soon as you stop taking it, you're going to gain it all back again. This right. is a, a year from now, I like to say, yep. you will be a different person in more ways than just losing a little bit around your waist, a completely different person. Yes, and people always ask, uh, how long will it take? Mm-hmm. It's going to take um, as long as it takes, and everybody's different. And your health, your health e- issues can be deeper than others, depending on where you've been at for, you know, your life and and things. Now, now Kim is here, and Kim probably doesn't realize I was hospitalized for aspartame poisoning from the diet pop that I drank. 
I uh, had liver failure starting at um, age 50, and it was functioning about 35%. And that was from the toxic overload from all the chemicals that we take in every day. Um, and we are exposed to over 300 chemicals a day. And then uh, the raging the raging tire around the stomach. Turn 50, the volcano happened for me. And then that's when I became passionate to help people with their health, their healthy home, uh, get anything with the word fragrance out of your home, and and let's clean it up inside right. and out. Kim Perkle. Yes. I want Who to. Who is 40 and knows <laughs> what she's talking about, all right? And so I was like, does she know <laughs> All right, so I want to ask, let's just start with the definition. What is what is probate? Do you hear it all around? Got to go through probate. Yes, ma'am. Time out. Mm-hmm. You always ask, like, her background first. You mm-hmm. didn't go there to what got her to probate or what got her to. Are you interested in what her background is, Sheila? Yeah, because you right. always are. Well, let's, have, let's talk about it. What are you, what are you pointing did at? Did you the... push that record button? Of course I okay, did. Okay, well, you missed last week, so. Oh. <laughs> That's why I'm she's checking. she's pointing at the screen like I'm, I'm not <laughs> saying anything. Too, and what like, did you think? I thought there was something in the way of the camera. Sign language. All honey. right, all right. Come on. Okay, got it. Let's start up. Okay, so you're an attorney. Yes. All right. Why? Oh gosh. Um. Well, I I kind of took an interest to, in the law eighth grade. Wow. Didn't have any family that had ever gone to college, let alone law school. So it seemed like kind of a pipe dream, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Burnsville. Okay. Moved to Prior Lake when I was about t- uh, 14 years old and um, went to college, did kind of a social work track. And Where'd you go to school? University of Minnesota. Okay. And then decided that I was going to pursue that. So I actually took my first job all the way out in Arizona wow. and did child protection there for about three and a half, four years. Mm. You got some um, good stories. Yes, Top in duty. South Phoenix, yeah. and got to spend a lot of time in the courtroom um, and thought, hey, if these people can do this, mm-hmm. I can do this. Sure. So a little bit later on, I went to law school, and I started in Arizona, but um, that same year I started law school, I started dating my husband. So okay. he's from here. We decided we needed to get back here. So my second year of law school, I was back at the U of M, graduated here, and the whole time I've been practicing, I've been here. Okay. Did you have a, a per, when you first got out of law school, then did you have a particular type of law that you wanted to go into that you were gravitated towards? I did. I thought I went to law school with the plan of doing child protection and family law. Um, and my second year of law school, I, I met a gal, and it, actually not through law school, but she was a lawyer, and she asked if I wanted to have kids. And I said, yeah, I think I would mm-hmm. do that someday. And she said, then don't do what you're trying to oh, do. Your sure. calendar will be run by the courts. You will have no um, flexibility in your schedule. And she knew it best because she was doing it. Mm-hmm. And I, she said, you should do estate planning, probate, something like that. And so I took a class, and then I took every class I could because I just loved it. It was so interesting. I do a lot of estate planning, and that leads into the probate, the trust administration, things of that nature. All right. So we deal with all of that in in uh, in our real estate practice. So, and when when uh, people call, or when someone dies and they call and they realize that they have to go through probate, many of them don't know what that is even. I know. Uh, so can you give us just a, a little, like a top-down, quick description of what exactly is probate and what's its purpose? In English for us. Yeah, yeah dumb, <laughs> dumb it down to third grade. Well, fifth grade. Okay, yeah, like so fifth harder grader. than a fifth grade. Yeah, and I fail those questions all the time. <laughs> so I don't know what fifth graders they're talking about, but I haven't met them. Mm-hmm. Private school. Exactly, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah and that's where I Not don't public relate. school. <laughs> so probate is, um, it's a court it's the same court now that divorces people that you may have a real estate lawsuit and there's there's no separate division anymore. So it's a court that oversees the administration of someone's estate. All right. That is as simple, simple as, as, as can be. And there is a process, a legal process that is defined and is pretty actually standardized, isn't it, throughout the country? Yes, it, it, there's just a few variations, but I mean, every state has probate. Right, but county by county, it's all pretty standardy, uh, and there's a process that one has to go through. Who who winds up being the asset manager or the or the personal rep or or the uh, uh, 
uh, executor of the estate. And we'll hit that when we come back we and break. This is Our Healthy Homes, ourhealthyhomes.com. Hey, welcome back. Thanks for staying with us. This is Our Healthy Homes, ourhealthyhomes.com. We're speaking with Kim Perkle. And I am so excited because we're talking about probate and probate between probate and divorce. I don't know which one is more interesting to me because I like high conflict, high, <laughs> high emotion, <laughs> high stress situations. I just I, I work well in that environment, and these can can be turn into that really quickly when you've got siblings, and it seems like at the point of when somebody passes away, that those twenty years of animosities seem to resurface uh, at that point. And, are uh, there any that don't turn out to be like that? Yes. Well, there are. but <laughs> There are. Okay. And it's yeah. amazing and it feels so good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we were, when we went out to break, we were talking about the process. Yes. And um, I asked the question, uh, who determines, like, who's the, who's the personal rep and, and uh, how is, who's the executor? How is that, all that determined? Okay, so let's go back one step. So first of all, the number one misconception I deal with in probate is people think if I have a will, it controls everything I own. And I just had a question this morning, you know, why, why, what do you, what would you say about the online will? The online will itself may be just fine, but you have no idea you're not getting the advice about what it actually controls. Which of your assets is going to be governed by this will? And in Minnesota, that's only two categories real estate, which is why I'm here. Mm -hmm. And the second category is personal property in excess of $75,000. So what is personal property? Personal property can be a bank account. It could be your car. It could be a business at asset, right? You got a, a rental ring. property, you're yep. an LLC. That's personal property in Minnesota. And so you, if you have a will, that's what is going to control those types of assets. But most people have a whole other bucket of what I call non-probate assets. Those, that, those things that have beneficiary designations on them, life insurance, retirement accounts. Maybe you have a POD, pay on death, transfer on death on your bank account. Mm -hmm. Your will doesn't have anything to do with those. Okay, so now let's go to your question. Once we have the need for probate, someone owns a house, who gets to be that personal representative that most states call the executor role? We wanted to be fancy. We call it personal representative, okay. right? Mm -hmm. One, if your will has a person named that you are nominating to be your personal representative, it's going to be a hard burden to overcome that that shouldn't be the person. What right? if Is that person doesn't want to do it? They don't have to. They okay. actually have to sign an acceptance. In this state, you cannot force anyone to do that. Okay. Right? So sometimes a will will name someone because it's 30 years old and it was, you know, someone's sister and yep. now she has, you know, three Alzheimer's. 40 year old kids, yeah. right? Well, if the sister's deceased, she obviously can't act. And now the court's going to be looking for the next person. We have a whole statute that deals with priority as to who can serve as personal representative. And her adult children are going to fall into the first place category. Can you ever have two? Yes. On, set, set up right from the get-go. <clears throat> yes. Used with caution. Just okay. because <laughs> you can doesn't mean you should. That's yeah. right. Okay. Exactly. So right. <laughs> think about it. Uh, what I always tell people, sure, you can name both your kids, and if they can't agree on everything, then you might as well not have named either one of them. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. Okay. Right. So All I right. just went through this with a friend, and, okay, this probably happens a lot. Mixed, you know, mm. second marriages mm -hmm. for both of them. Mm -hmm. They each have kids, and, you know, he wants his kids, she wants her kids. Mm -hmm. They're at different levels, you know, blah, 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 and... I just, I just told her, I said, sweetie, like, don't do it. Don't have it be any of the kids. They're still in their early 20s, number one. Yes. Number two, you, the, you don't need this to create an issue with you guys right now while you're alive, Correct. right? So pick somebody pick that you trust, that's, that, you know, doesn't have to be a family member, you know, blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. about a week later, she came back and she said, well, we, we talked about it and um, we want to name you. Oh. I was like, okay. okay. Well, that well, that's not what I had in my mind. That's not what I had in mind. But okay. Uh, but okay. Right? Just because you need that neutral party. You really do. And some people will say, well, I'll choose one person from this side of the family oh, and one person from ooh, this side of the bad. family. And it's always... Ooh, do they get along? What is, do they hang out? 
orders the only time they see each other at your house once a once a year for Christmas. Probably not a good situation. Funerals and weddings. We have companies all over Minnesota that that's what they do. They're neutral people that have no relation to anyone. And if they're if it's um if they're lucky enough to have a friend like you to take the role and you want to do that, you know, then it all then it all can work better than choosing one from one side of the. So family. there's companies that do that. Yes, there's sure. fiduciary companies out there that they serve as people's personal representatives, trustees, guardians, healthcare agents, et cetera. I'm on it. Let me yep. do it. There's one right here in Egan. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Now, uh, you know, you, you have a grandma passed away and she had a collection of this, that, and the other thing. You know, she wasn't a rich. She had the house was paid for and, and, uh, but a lot of like knickknacks and stuff and some good, some not so good. Antiques maybe. And, and, uh, the family comes in after, the funeral and it's like uh shopping at a discount store i mean they're in there just raiding the place yeah. you know what is a personal re- a rep now the executor what responsibility does he have to maintain the integrity and protect those assets from being basically stolen from the estate so first problem is is that you can't get a personal representative appointed overnight. Right. One of the things you'll hear from me probably repeatedly today is probate takes a while, Mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, certain counties it can get, you know, you could have a personal representative maybe appointed in a month to two. Other counties, it could take three months. So if you have a situation where someone is, can't pay the taxes that are due, can't pay the utilities, Mm -hmm people are breaking and entering, that's not going to be a regular probate. That's going to be a special administration, essentially what is an emergency probate proceeding. But you have to have a qualifying emergency, right? The courts are going to say, what is it that cannot wait a month to two for you to do the normal notice requirements, et cetera? I'm not talking so much about that as what I've experienced is that uh, the son or the grandson is named as the executor or the, or the uh, personal rep. And we use those interchangeably. I thought executor was if it's named in the will, it's executor. If it's someone who raises their hand and says, I'll do it, then that's the personal rep. No, is that not true? That's not true. Minnesota, okay. it's all personal all representative. Yep. No executor. Okay. Correct. So the per- good, then I can I can I don't have to remember that term anymore because <laughs> yes. I always forget it. Okay, so the personal rep is, is uh, going to be the grandson. Everybody agrees that it's going to be the grandson. But as you said, he's still got to petition the county, mm-hmm. you know, fill out the paperwork, go in there and wait to be appointed. So so what does that look like? I mean, how, how does that happen? How long does he have to wait? Or Yeah. Yeah. I, like I said, in some counties, I could probably get a PR is what we call them appointed in a month. Okay. In some counties, it could take three. And so going back to your examples, if I think somebody like this grandson's family is breaking into the house and they're going through and picking out it's more like the pressure that's put on yeah, the grandson yep to and, let him come in okay well again before he accepts that appointment and before the court appoints him he has no responsibility and no liability he doesn't need to do anything but he's going to feel compelled to do something mm-hmm. and he if first if if he can't deal with the pressure and handle that appropriately, he may not be the right person to do it. Explain to me then, there's two things I'm going to know. One is the letter, the letters of testament, yes. the testamentary or whatever. So one of them is the letters and there's actually two sets of letters. One is that the, that the uh, personal rep has been approved or appointed or whatever the term is appointed appointed and then the second set comes out when he's actually when it's actually okay now you can sign the closing papers and the documents what's the difference between those two and why is there that time delay between the two well so what i think you're talking about so there is only one letters it's either letters testamentary which are the letters that are issued when someone's will is probated okay okay Letters of general administration okay. are the letters that an estate would receive when there was no will. Because recall, 50% of the population will never do estate planning. And so we have to have what? this bu- 50%. Prince, no will, nothing. Oh, okay? that's... Oh my so God. we have laws of intestacy, these default laws that deal with people's estate when they've done no planning. 
I think what you're talking about is the letters get issued when the person gets appointed. But then when you go to close on the real estate, you got to go back and get a new copy of certified letters to show that at the time you were closing, you were still appointed. Okay. That clears it up. Okay. That clears it up because I've, I've had I've had it wh- you know, when they got their letters and we thought, okay, we're all good. We got the property out. And we go to closing. The title company says, well, we, you can't close. You got to get new you letters. You got to get new letters. And they, you have to have it for 30 days or, is, or some period Two of time. Two types of probates. Okay. Informal, informal. Informal. Most of them are informal, aren't they? Um, I prefer formal. Oh. It's safer for the personal representative, right? Then they get a court order that says what's supposed to happen, and now their rear is covered. Okay. Right, okay. We're coming back to that. All right. Break. This is our Healthy Homes, our <laughs> Healthy Homes com. Sheila's taking us we out need, the break. This might be a two-part <laughs> series because <laughs> I have just I so know. many questions. All right. This is our Healthy Homes, 651-775-9194. If you want yes. to get a hold of Kim, 612-875-3894. <laughs> 49 612-875-3849 we'll be right back we're here in the studio with sheila hitner (laughs) (laughs) yes okay okay and uh and kim perkle perkle Perkle. Mm -hmm. all right and uh attorney at law yes and we're talking probate yes and when we went out we talked about we were were, as i was posing the question formal or informal that's right and what is the difference and you shocked me by saying you prefer formal, yes. which I thought would be a slower and more cumbersome process. Okay, so a lot of people think that. So in the informal process, once your letters are issued, that's when you have that 30-day waiting period. In the formal process, as soon as the letters are issued, you're free to sell. So the question becomes, how soon can I get a hearing? Is it going to be longer than that 30 days that I'm going to have to wait anyways? Because, right, you got to do your notice. you got to file the probate. you got to get your publication done, letters issued. Then you got to wait 30 days. Mm-hmm. Or can I just file all of this, get my hearing date, and know that my letters are going to be signed that day or the next day? And oftentimes, I will tell you, the formal ends up winning. Certain counties, Interesting. probably not, but most of the outskirt counties. Okay. Hennepin County, Ramsey County. Hennepin is going to be slower in slower. the formal process. Mm-hmm. Who determines informal or formal? It's a conversation you have with the personal representative oftentimes, but also the will typically elects for that. So the will will have language that the testator is asking for the, um, you know, the maker of the will is asking for it to be as informal and unsupervised by the court as as possible. Mm. We often recommend that because it's the least amount of money. But then when it comes to time for the personal representative to make that choice, they can always make whatever choice they feel comfortable, even if it's not the decision of the testator. So the conversation goes like this in terms of informal and informal. What types of assets are we dealing with? If it's just one house and it's one kid and there's no disputes, there's no debts, yes, that is an ideal situation, right? We're not dealing with time clocks. We're not dealing with beneficiaries that are arguing. There's no debts, et cetera. An ideal situation for informal. Informal. Mm-hmm. Formal, we start to ask, okay, is this estate, um, uh, does it have debts? Are, are the debts potentially going to I- exceed the assets? Do we have creditor claims? Are the beneficiaries fighting? Is there any type of um, disagreement between the beneficiaries and this PR? Is there any reason why the PR just needs the comfort of a court order with a deadline to appeal that order just to make themselves feel comfortable? And if any of those questions are yes, we're going to go formal. So no will. Yes. And and a, a slew of errors. Yes. That's a problem. Well, yes, because you have to look at that list for the first battle out of probate is who is the personal representative, right? right? And then if we have will contests or anything, we're dealing with that way later stage. But the first battle is who gets to serve. So if you have a whole bunch of beneficiaries and they can't agree, yes, you're going to have a battle at the first stage. Even if you have four siblings and they all agree it should be the oldest brother, they get to sign a nomination and a renunciation, and then the court just moves with that. So but going back to the discussion we had off topic yep. about you and your friend yep. and dealing with, you know, who should who should I name when I have a blended family? If I don't name a neutral, how does that work? Well, you know, one of the things that happens in court when we go to that first court hearing on the battle, the court will say, look, if you all can't agree, I'm appointing a neutral. Mm-hmm. So you might end up there anyways. Mm-hmm. Sure. 
Do you have forgot, something? Yeah, I forgot. What it was. Sorry okay, to come back. nomination. So, so we got the uh, this. This is another question that comes up frequently. So, uh, Grandma passed. I'm picking on Grandma today. So, <laughs> gra Grandma passes, or Grandpa, <laughs> or Grandpa, and they have a mortgage, a current mortgage yes. on the property, and they have some credit cards, obviously, and they've got the phone bill, and they've got the this bill, and they got the insurance, and they've got all of that stuff, and those those. Uh, bills th those services continue to accrue yes and and now we've got this time lag between when when the passing was until somebody is appointed mm -hmm. and there's i know that there's there's like you know should give notifications to these companies so that you know many times the credit card companies will just stop it you know they okay we'll just wait then until you settle and and all that stuff but at that point no one even has authorization to do any of that right so what would you recommend that they do just nothing and wait or what it's case by case so you know if i have a, a you know um someone come in their parents died they're very familiar with the house they're familiar with the bills they have the resources to continue those on. I say, hey, it's not a bad idea to just pay the taxes, pay the utilities, because otherwise you're going to have to deal with contesting all these late fees later and who wants that For, hassle. Pay them from the Their personal oak, assets. Oak, right? From whose personal assets? Their own. The, the whoever, they, whoever is trying to take control of the okay. reins and is going to eventually be the administrator of our estate. Whoever's okay. coming to see I always, me, I can you get guard that back? Against that. Yes. Yeah, you can get it back. Okay. Right. Well, so then how did we do my dad's? Because because I had, um, so I had to pay like the Discover bill and I had to pay the utilities to keep it going. And we had uh, one of his, um, his retirement funds or something where the Edward Jones, where we had them split that into the, the seven. That's a and, different, whole different But then had them sign the check back to me to be able to pay yes. the bills. But when did we do that? That was what, what long down the road. You were already appointed. We had a, ch okay. sep a checking okay. account set okay. up in the estate's okay. name and, and okay. all that all stuff. Right. So but the interim, the gas bill. Yeah. You know, you don't right. want them to shut the gas right. out. The gas exactly. bill, the electric bill, the things like that. Um, but now what if saying, somebody can't? Yeah. Right? Yeah, right. What if somebody what can't if have they the ability? come in and they're like, I'm named here, but I don't, I cannot I don't have float money. this right. house, right? right? Well, that is an emergency, okay. right? There could be dissipation and loss of assets if I don't take immediate action to secure this estate. There you get a special administrator appointed way quicker than a personal representative, and now they can start accessing those bank accounts to pay these debts. All right, so then I'm, now I'm going to go down a couple different <laughs> places here. One of them is, uh, with that in mind, you need to set up an account in the estate's name, correct? The personal representative personal rep will, will do that, correct. Up, and then the estate has a tax ID number. Uh, that is number. correct. So that all takes time, and you got to go to the bank, yep. and you got to turn all, yep. and that can't happen until they've been appointed. That's right. Because otherwise nobody uh, talks right. to anyone. And then I have people always saying that, oh, we can just do it ourselves because the forms are right online at the at the state, and we just get the forms and, and do it ourselves. And I'm not saying that they've never gone smoothly. Mm hmm but it's rare. And it's the case where it's a, a single person died and, they're, and they've got essentially the house. It's very simple estate. Yes. But if there's any other kind of an estate, it seems like it's so complicated that who would even want to do that? Well, it's one of the reasons people start thinking, is there a way to avoid probate? Mm -hmm. Right? Because we've just named a multitude of factors, the waiting game. The cost, we haven't even talked about that, right? Most people can't do this on their own. They need to hire me. Right. They need to hire someone to help them. That costs money. So then they start asking themselves, well, do I? does my family have to go through this probate process or are there other ways to avoid that? And then we're lucky in Minnesota there are. What about uh, when there are assets involved that there's unknown value? So you know, Grandpa has this car in the, a couple of cars in the garage that, you know, he loved those cars. He's had them ever since he was a kid. <laughs> and they, they're just like brand new off the showroom floor. I don't know and, how we got to Grandpa and, from Grandpa, and, but uh, okay. And, yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, you know, the grandson would sure like those cars. And so let's just, you know, he needs a car. Is that, I mean, you don't know, that car could be worth $100,000. 
what's the evaluation process or like jewelry or artwork or something like that is there a formal evaluation process that needs to be conducted or are they free just to kind of say yep let let uh, uh, grandpa junior take it not free but they must act in good faith as a reasonable and ordinary person would and use commercial reasonable standards to value property. You know, if someone's asking me and it's it's the same answer that applies to real estate. So the question is, is am I required as the personal representative to get my real estate appraised before I sell it? No, right? You don't real estate can be sold especially in today's market for its actual value because you have multiple bids sure. and it's probably going for more mm-hmm. than it's even worth as YouTube know better than I do. So getting an appraisal might not even help in that scenario because the sale price is way higher than the appraisal price. Mm-hmm. So you're not required to get those things valued, but you can't undersell things. So if you want to protect yourself and there's a question about the value, you want to maybe go get go on Kelly Blue Book have that printout that you actually looked for what it was valued at, at. least so, at least made a good faith effort that's effort. exactly correct so with with my dad's we had every I, I had it set up for one weekend for everybody to come you know for whatever they wanted okay and this was way before so I literally had my list and I had everybody I wrote down absolutely everything that everybody took okay just because I didn't know if I was going to need that later to balance out that what they're going to get based on what they took before we got to that point does that make sense sure does <laughs> and were you we'll asking a question or, or yeah <laughs> i think so okay <laughs> confirming my okay my so you're going to repeat that when we come back from break and put in a question format oh, well, this is our healthy homes our healthy homes.com 651-775-9194 our healthy homes.com we'll be right back all right so now i got a question about this just a couple things in Minnesota, yes, married couple, yeah, and no will, okay, and one of the, uh. one spouse or the other dies, passes away. Um, is how do we know who gets the property? I mean, okay. is there special rules or you know, there's a bunch of kids, you know, sitting there thinking, oh, wow, we want to get that house and you know get it sold, so we, you know, how's that work? So first place you got to look as title in the real mm-hmm. estate records, right? Just because they're married, are we dealing with a situation in which they own it in joint tenancy? Married doesn't equal joint Same tenancy, tenancy. Okay. right? And if you owned the house before she moved in and then you got married, it still doesn't create a joint tenancy. You would have to do another deed transferring it from you and her because now she has a marital interest to you and her as joint tenants. So the first place we're going to look is the real estate records. Okay. I was under the assumption that you bought it single, then we get married, that I automatically have- You have marital interest, too, to sell. Yes. But we're oh, talking about dying. The joint te- right. Okay. So yes. we so they didn't right. do that. So they Let's say didn't most, do that. And how many people- ooh. I know. I know. They didn't That's do bad. that. Right. So right. then what? Okay. So the question is now if they got they he <laughs> where are we? <laughs> she she owned the house. I'm gonna I'll make her the good guy. I love oh, she I love owned the day. house All right, that's prior great. to them getting married. Okay. He was a bum. Didn't own anything. <laughs> managed to talk her into marrying him. So now he's living in her house. Yep. And then she you passes. Okay. So. They're married, Mm -hmm. so he does have an interest. But here, because he wasn't on title, he is subject to the homestead laws and the kind of exemption statute. He is going to get a life estate only. Okay, which means what? So he can stay there. He the life estate laws apply where he has to pay taxes, mortgage, insurance, utilities, general upkeep, life expenses. Okay. It gets a little murky when we're talking about roof that could last 25 years. Sure. But then upon his death or the termination of his life estate, let's say he just voluntarily leaves, it's going to go to her kids. Okay. Unless her will says otherwise. Okay. Let's say that there's a mortgage on the property. It, and the, he continues to pay the mortgage. Who's the mortgage in? Well, it the doesn't matter. The mortgage is in her name. But he's going to continue to pay it. he continues to pay it. Okay. If he doesn't pay it, the mortgage company is still going to be able to foreclose, foreclose sure, just like anyone else. Yeah. And wherever this house But goes, he does pay it. So he, now it's five years later and now he bails out. Yep. 
That's Does he get his money nothing. back? No, he doesn't. Ah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay, so we got to check the real estate records and make mm-hmm. sure it happens a lot. Sheila, people come into my office. We're married. We're both on title. We look at the records and they're like, no, you're not. Okay, so if you if you have gotten married, yep, mm-hmm. all right, go and go do the quick claim deed. Absolutely. Do it. Change the title. Right. The title. To protect not the interest, yourself. But the yes. title to the joint tenancy. Because right. you can, because of my, if I'm hearing this right, you could come into a situation like that, work for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years towards that property, pay, making the payments, maintaining the property, and and wind up with nothing. Correct. And if you need that done, you just call us. Yeah, we'll, right? we'll help you. We'll, we'll, we'll help you with that. Okay, okay so now I joined, I, are we in joint tennis? No, one more thing. No, <laughs> She's like, no, you're not. This. You're not anywhere on the, <laughs> not anything. I made sure of that. <laughs> okay. Um, when you were sleeping, I grabbed your I hand it, and it, squiggled it, your it, line, it, and we were good. Okay. Okay. So now let's talk about the transfer on death. Uh, oh, Lord. Deed. Deed. oh yeah, okay. 507071 so, is the statute. We're explain about. that to the listeners so they understand how that works. Okay, we're one of about 30 states that has this thing. Different states call it different things. We here call it a transfer on death deed. Mm-hmm. The easiest way to think about it is a beneficiary designation for real estate. Okay. I own my house and I want to give it to Sheila upon my death. It is as simple as that. I, Kim Perkle, transfer to Sheila Hitner, effective on the date of my death, my property in Prior Lake, legal description, parcel identification number. I sign it. Here's the tricky part. Has to be recorded before death. So transfer on death deeds don't work don't work well in a you know deathbed situation. Okay. Has to be recorded for it to be effective. And as soon as I'm deceased, she files an affidavit with the county with my death certificate, and that house is hers, subject to any encumbrances that were mine as well. And that that transfer of death deed then can can be done that with the property, and then the the uh, will, and and um, the assets of whatever else can can be given to other people and correct. Yeah. Now the house, because of the transfer on death deed, yeah. is no longer subject to probate right. and therefore no longer controlled by the terms of the will. Right. Because yeah. upon her death, yes. it's gone. It's gone. It's right. gone. Let me ask you this then. So now that home transfers, got a la- nice lake place, always liked it. <laughs> and uh, grandma and grandpa got killed in a car crash. I'm going to kill them both this time. <laughs> okay, so they got, got killed got in a car crash. And there's a here. transfer on death deed to the grandson because he's been up there since he's a little kid. But it has a mortgage on it. Yep. He can no more no more afford to pay that mortgage than the man in the mood. So he gets the house, yes, but he also gets the encumbrance along with it. That's correct. Can he just turn around and sell it then? Yes. Yes. Well, he could, but yeah. but how does that work? I mean, you know, now he's. I mean, the mortgage company, the people who signed the deed, mm-hmm. have they're dead. They're dead. So or signed the note, the the right. mortgage. Yeah. So. What are they, all they have to do is foreclose, really, or call well, it due so, on sale, or is it like a due on sale? They just call it, or a lot of the old mortgages had those due on sale clauses. With these newer mortgage, we don't see that as often. But here is what I've seen and confirmed with a close friend of mine who's in the mortgage business. One, I've never seen a mortgage company reject someone's check. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. They don't yeah. care yeah. No. who it's coming Who's, from. No, really. If it's supposed to be going to that real estate, they will take it. The second thing is the mortgage person I talked to said the same exact thing. They just want their money. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to foreclose if someone's paying. But under your example, if he can't, he pay, can't pay, his only option is to rent or sell. Okay. That's it. He can't get rid of the mortgage. And, you know, it's one of the questions we ask our, our clients is if you transfer this property to them subject to this mortgage, do they have the ability to pay? Right. So we try to get that advantage. But let me... I need to say this about transfer on death deeds because everybody (laughs) thinks they're so fantastic, right? (laughs) They're a couple hundred, 300 bucks. So we get clients that come in and say, look, I got four kids and I'm just, we want to take our house and have it go to the four kids. And those are called transfer on death deeds gone bad, Mm -hmm. right? So their whole purpose for us is we have to avoid probate. That is not always a good option when no. you have four beneficiaries. Because Probate recall, is merely a process. It's a process, but you have one person in charge. Yeah. In this transfer on death deed situation, they all have equal say. 
They all equally have to choose a realtor, each equally have to set the listing price, equally pay all of the expenses. And if they can't agree, then we're in a partition action, which is a hundred times worse than probates. So they need to be used with caution. Next thing that you hear a lot of <laughs> is trusts. Yes. You'll hear everything. Put it in a trust. Put it in a trust. Like that's a magic pill yes. to put it in a trust. Is the trust a magic pill? It certainly is magic. Okay. Because just like a will is a piece of paper, so is a trust. But the laws behind it are so much different. They say if your house is in a trust, it's no longer subject to court. There's no filing requirement for the trust. It is a 100% private administration. The only people that can see the trust are the people who make the trust, the people who are named as trustees, and the beneficiaries. That is it. So when they're magic, because what if someone doesn't do what they're supposed to do? There's no oversight of this magical thing. Is it right for every case? Absolutely not. Okay, who's it not right for? Simple estates. If you just have one house and oh. one kid, a trust is totally overkill. Your transfer on death deed is going to work magical in that situation. Who it is good for? People who have business interests that have a desire to keep their administration out of the public view. People who have beneficiaries that don't get along. People that have blended families and there needs to be some restriction on what one spouse can do upon the first spouse's death, right? Because then we could disinherit a whole yes. side of the family, yes. right? So if there's needs to be more control beyond the grave, a trust is a perfect situation. And here's the thing I will t I tell almost all my clients. You're, the money is going to be spent. If you go to probate, even the simple probate, one house, one bank account, someone's going to pay me 2500 bucks to do that. A trust for a married couple I draft for $2,500. So, right, and now I've just capped what your fees are and you have a completely private administration. Talk about transferring the property then into the trust. Yeah. And uh, about half the uh, homes in the country have a mortgage on them. Yes. Well, how's that work? Okay, so I do things a little bit differently. And if we called another attorney right now, they probably do it different than I do. But I take advantage of the fact that we have a transfer on death deed state here. So what I do is I say, I'm going to put your real estate in your trust upon death. So that during your lifetime, you don't need to get the permission of your mortgage company. You don't need to redo your homestead oh. classification. I'm funding your trust upon death so I can make your lives simple during your That's lifetime. That's very clever. Mm -hmm. I'm not, so the transfer and death deed is between us and the trust. That's right. Awesome. Yep. That's, <laughs> this is Our Healthy Homes. You're a smart girl. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> this is Our Healthy Homes. Our Healthy Homes. You want oh. to talk to Kim, 612 eight seven five three eight four nine six one two eight seven five three eight four nine call her before you die get <laughs> yeah, stuff call set her up tomorrow you've got get you've stuff got your set up directors. in advance you got your will you got all your stuff you need to take care of our healthy homes we'll be back next week but when he calls me sugar i love that man with all my Tell him, honey, you can call me sugar.